Hello and welcome to a Media 7 special from the annual conference of the Screen Production and Development Association in Auckland. I'm Russell Brown. Now, by tradition, each year's SPARTA conference opens with a guest speech, the John O'Shea Memorial Lecture. The speech is delivered by an individual with a record of achievement in the screen industry, and the brief is to be provocative. Michael Steadman, Managing Director of Natural History New Zealand, scored on both counts this year. For me, public broadcasting is very simple. It's about choice, it's about diversity, it's about depth, it's about substance, and it speaks to our innate curiosity. It celebrates our creative achievements, it inspires, and it's a place of endless possibilities. I've been part of an industry that has been the victim of ongoing political manipulation, of arrogance, of ignorance, of never-ending change, an industry of immense uncertainty. I remember well visiting an MP to express my deep concern at what was happening to, the public, to public broadcasting and my concern at its apparent demise. That was in 1973. Successive ministers of broadcasting from both sides of the house, I said I was not aligned, have over a very long period implemented change, all in the belief that they and their departments knew better. In turn, they have appointed boards, compliant boards, who, with some exceptions, have understood little about the industry that they have the power to wreak havoc over. The Charter was appallingly drafted, never implemented, and didn't really make one iota of difference. It was yet another step in a long line of political tinkering, another chapter in ill-conceived change. The same government gave us TVNZ6 and TVNZ7, but with funding for only five years. You know, again, we're getting the short-term vision. If they'd been serious about it, they would have funded it for not five, but 10 or 15, and allowed it to grow and allowed it to find a voice and to find a place. But at least it was some attempt, some acknowledgement of public uh, service broadcasting and some acknowledgement that it had a role. But under the present government and the present Minister of Broadcasting, there is no such acknowledgement. He believes that all citizens' needs can be met by commercial broadcasting, including Sky, and that the market should rule. Well, I'm sorry, Minister, that is unacceptable. You are the Minister of Broadcasting in all its forms, and that brings with it the responsibility to ensure that there is more on offer free to air than the completely commercial and advertising-driven programming that is commercial television. The assumption that all needs can be met by a commercial market also begs an important question. Does television create the market that it responds to, or does the market demand what it's giving them. There's this dichotomy. In my view, New Zealanders deserve and have a fundamental right to a great deal more choice than two flavours or three flavours or four flavours of candy floss. Michael Steadman there, and if you were there live, you'll know that the original speech had a lot more swearing in it. Anyway, I caught up with Michael Steadman after his O'Shea speech. When I started in television, there was a huge range, you know, you, we used to have, you know, the orchestra and we'd have ballets and we'd have debates and we'd have all sorts of things which really reflected who we were. How do we know who we are? You know, we don't. You know, people in Auckland have no concept of what it's like to be in the south of New Zealand and the south of New Zealand the same. We have no concept of the richness, the diversity, the remarkable things that Kiwis are doing. Where do we see that? We don't see it at all. And I think that public service broadcasting has a role in that. And if anybody doubts that, look at the success from the beginning of time of country calendar. People countrywide love watching country calendar. And what it's about? It's about ordinary people doing ordinary things in ordinary places. There's no, you know, nothing spectacular at all. And it speaks to who we are. Years ago, a television New Zealand programmer said to me that people don't like documentaries, it makes them think. There is a concern that I have, is that there, there is a view that anything that is vaguely intelligent 
um, doesn't have a place. It's got to be you know, more trivial, or it's got to be the big fat people having operations. And there's this view that you know people aren't interested in something that has substance. If you hold that thought for one minute and then go to Sky and look at the block of documentary channels uh, and know something about how popular those are, then you know that gives a lie to what audiences actually want. You know, the History Channel on Sky, extraordinarily successful. The Crime Channel, very successful. Nat Geo, Discovery, all of those channels find big audiences. So I find it surprising that a lot of what we do not all of it, but a lot of it doesn't find a home on free to air. I suspect that the Minister of Broadcasting, Jonathan Coleman, would say exactly that, that that programming is there on Sky for those who want it. What's the problem? Well, the only problem is that you've got to pay a lot of money to get access to it. And I, I think that there is a fundamental question in New Zealand about whether, you know, the government's abolished the licence fee because it was um, uh, too much for people to pay. Now you put that against Sky, you know, a Sky subscription is a huge amount of money and that is going to put all of that programming out of the reach for a substantial uh, number um, of our citizens and that is wrong. I've heard the Minister say this year at the public meeting that uh, they won't be regulating Sky. Is there any way of uh, addressing what you say is, is the issues with Sky's dominance outside of regulation? The Minister says we won't be regulating it. I think people need to be talking to the Minister about the landscape. Sky have a very professional uh, operation and they have very, very good lines of communication and in, in, into the Minister. This industry doesn't. You've got all of these bits and pieces all over the place, um, you know, all yapping. And they, in large part, in my view, are ignored. In that sense, your speech was a rallying cry, wasn't it? That, that was yep. how you concluded? Yep, absolutely. because. You know, if, if we are to succeed, if we are to preserve um, something that I think is immensely valuable from both a cultural and economic point of view and have a long-term vision, we have to be able to go to government as, as an industry and say, look, here are the rational arguments. We've got to get rid of the emotive stuff. We've got to say, this is good for the country in terms of diversity, richness, all of those things, cultural things, um, but it also has a real economic benefit. This will grow industries, and here are the examples, the SBP, Gibson Group, NHNZ, all, all had their um, groundings in public service broadcasting. So by this you mean public service broadcasting with public service values? Yeah, I think so. Look, you know, I, I, I think either the government uh, supports TVNZ and says, yeah, we're going to get on with it, or we look for an alternative. But I think we've got to put everything on the table. We're tinkering around, as I said, with a model that was set up many, many years ago. Is it time to look at all the pieces on the table and say, how can we reshape those? How can we reorganise those? How can we come up with something that does give public service uh, broadcasting a voice? Uh, and importantly, gives New Zealanders a voice. Because when you look at the landscape of television right now, it's a very, very, very narrow group of people that have a voice on uh, uh, television um, in this country. You also seem quite happy with the concept of, of actually selling TVNZ. Why would you keep it? You know, if its mandate is truly, truly commercial, then why? You know, um, the, the, there is no point. I always thought that we held on to it and it was important because it had a public service mandate. Part of the dual remit was to be both profitable and, you know, and I do have an issue with Television New Zealand having to have been both things that is, you know, deliver a profit and be a, a public broadcaster. But now the public broadcaster component seems to have gone. And the, and the, the board and the government are saying, it's only, it's only profit. So why, why, why keep it? And use the money for what? Well, I would certainly use part of the money um, from the sale to go back into the industry to support public service broadcasting. And public service broadcasting doesn't need to be a huge, expensive beast. You know, there are ways of delivering channels and, and uh, content that are far, far less uh, costly than they were 10, 15 years ago. And it's about being innovative about it, you know. If the system as it is continues without change, do you think that loss is inevitable? Unless there's some sea change, yeah, I think it is. And we will be all the poor, no question. No question at all. We will lose a sense of who we are. Is it that all we're ever going to be from this point on uh, is a celebration of sports teams? Is that it? 
you know. The news service leads with all blacks. We get, we get rugby coming out our ears, we get league coming out our ears, we get soccer coming out our ears. Is that our total cultural identity? What about the, you know, <coughs> the, 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 the great young scientists in New Zealand? What about the artists? What about the musicians? What about the dancers? What about the actors? What about the writers? All of those people that make us who we are, no voice. We don't know who they are. You know, they, they, they may get some token 30 seconds somewhere in some obscure late night bulletin, but that's it. Michael Steadman of Natural History New Zealand. So the challenge has been laid. How will the minister respond? Jonathan Coleman joins me after the break.